What if you could take the new rules that NAR is about to impose on you coming up real soon? What if you could take those rules and build a more profitable business, a more efficient business, a more lean and mean business? Because that's exactly what I'm coaching my agents to do. Guys, you, you know me, right? So if you've been following me for a while, you realize that I am a an optimist, okay? <laughs> like I'm always looking at the positive side of anything. There's always two ways to look at something. There's a positive way and there's a negative way. Every single time, I don't care what it is, you can tell me anything in the world and, and I'm gonna tell you there's a negative way to look at it and there's a positive way to look at it. And when it comes to business, you've always got to look at the positive side of any situation and look for ways to take advantage, ways to capitalize on the opportunities. I'm not going to sit here and tell you that this is, you know, like this is the, this is a, this is the greatest opportunity and, you know, ever in the history of the industry. What I will tell you, what I will tell you is that the, the opportunity, okay, here's where I think the opportunity is. The opportunity is that it, 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 it forces you to find efficient ways to work. It, 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 this is going to shake you up from the way that we've been doing business. Okay. And it's going to say, okay, you've got to do business this way now. And I believe that this shake up is going to, is going to create a lot of efficiency in your business. If you're looking at the positive side of this, if you're only looking at the negative side and you know, it, it's holding you back and, you know, stopping your tracks and, you know, you, you just think this is just bogus and, you know, this is just, you know, well, there's nothing you could do about it. There's nothing you can do about it. You're going to have to live with it either way. You might as well. Uh, use it to your advantage because you can't change it. Will there be some deals lost that you would have got paid on in, in the way business is done today? Absolutely. Very, very, very few. But I believe that we make up more than the difference in the, any deals we might lose. Here, here's, here's, here's the punchline. I think we make up more, way more of the difference that we, of any deals that we might lose in efficiency doing more deals doing more deals at a higher level of efficiency. Efficiency, like I've said it like 15 times already in this video, I'm telling you, I believe that that's the direction we're going in. And I think that's what you really need to focus on. I'm gonna give you three ideas in this video uh, about how to do that. I got an email from my local board of realtors about exactly when the changes are gonna, are gonna come, play, come in place. Um, you know, so, so the rules, the new rules of the game, I'm going to share that email with you. I also got an email from the National Association of Realtors about their recent meeting last week with the Department of Justice um, and the three takeaways from that meeting. I want to share that with you. And then I want to get into just how you can make your business much more efficient in the new world that we're going to be living in very, very soon. So uh, pony up, get ready, and let's ride because I'm telling you, um, I'm excited about this. I don't like the new rules. I think that this whole thing is, like you, bogus. This was a complete money grab for the lawyers. There was a, a technicality in the way that commissions are, um, you know, uh, how they're paid out on a HUD statement, okay, on a settlement statement. Um, and they found that trans, they found that discrepancy. They found that, uh, you know, loophole there, and they were able to say, you know what, let's go make about a, a, a what, what was it, a billion dollars? They a billion dollar settlement. And the, by the way, the homeowners are going to get like twenty bucks a piece, something like that, right? The lawyers are going to walk away with the money, and the homeowners are going to walk away with like ten, twenty bucks, if that. Okay, what justice was really done here? And what, let's talk about it. So the uh, email from the National Association of Realtors. This is from Kevin Sears, the uh, president. I'm reaching out to share an update from Washington, D.C., where I was excited to, this week to meet with members of NAR leadership in an important meeting with the Department of Justice, their antitrust division, to discuss the issues the DOJ is reviewing uh, in the real estate industry. We were pleased that on the DOJ side, so they met with the uh, U.S. Assistant Attorney General, a top decision maker and leader on antitrust policy, 
Um, they also had the CEO of the National Association of Hispanic Real Estate Professionals there. Okay, he says this meeting was a big step in our progress in our uh, in our process to have a meaningful dialogue with the DOJ directly between leaders about issues that matter to us as realtors. Okay, I'm thinking like where where <laughs> where was that during the trial? Um, while there is much more work to be done, the meeting was productive as we try to find, quote, common ground on topics that define uh, how we do business and support the dream of home ownership in America. At the end of our meeting, my first question was, when can we meet again? <laughs> we are committed to continuing the conversations with the DOJ on topics such as the value realtors bring to a real estate transaction. OK. I mean, ugh. OK, <laughs> the critical importance of compensation in our industry offers a compensation, uh, a listing availability, consumer choice and promoting access to home ownership for all. All right. Coming out of the meeting, there were some clear takeaways we wanted to share with you regarding the areas of the DOJ focus as we work together to pr uh, prepare ahead of the August 17th practice change implementation date. OK, so we're still gunning for this August 17th date for these changes to come into effect. All right. So they bullet pointed three um, takeaways from the meeting. The first one was developing a new developing new or revised forms. OK, I encourage all members involved in creating new or revised forms to evaluate them for clarity and emphasis on consumer choice. The settlement empowers buyers and brokers to negotiate and mutually agree to services and compensation that that work for them. OK, realtors should work with consumers to ensure they fully understand the options available to them while continuing to seek fair compensation for their services. OK, uh, we've compiled tips on developing written buyer agreements here. So I went to this, and I'll put this link in the description so that you can go and read. Uh, this is right off NAR's website about buyer-broker uh, agreements, okay? And beginning August 17th, um, we'll be working with buyer, uh, uh, any, any participant, you know, agent, part of MLS, working with a buyer, will be required to enter into a written agreement with the buyer prior to touring a home, including both in-person and live virtual tour. So even if you're doing this virtually, You've got to have a buyer uh, agreement uh, signed, a written agreement um, that provides information about uh, what provisions uh, must be included in the written agreement pursuant to the NAR settlement, as well as other provisions that, while not required by the settlement, MLS participants may consider addressing with their clients. So keep in, keep in, uh, keep in mind, agreement forms should account for the choice and um, optionality consumers and real estate professionals have when negotiating their terms for a relationship permissible under state law, uh, the form should give real estate professionals and consumers the ability to efficiently memorialize uh, the relationship based on the, on the transparent and clear conversation they have when deciding to work together. So here's the mandatory provisions. Okay. Specify and conspicuously disclose the amount or rate of any compensation the MLS participant will receive from any source and how this amount will be determined. So how much we're getting paid and how that number comes to be. The amount of compensation must be objectively ascertainable uh, and may not be open-ended. Uh, for example, buyer broker compensation shall be whatever amount the seller is offering to the buyer. So it can't be like, whatever the sellers will and offer, right? It can't say that, right? They want it to say exact number that the buyer is going to pay the buyer agent if in fact the seller does not pay, uh, not offering a buyer agent commission. Include a statement that the MLS participant may not receive compensation from any source that exceeds the amount or rate agreed to with the buyer. So basically this is saying, hey, if a seller is offering more, uh, then what we've agreed to on paper, Mr. Buyer, then I cannot receive any more than what we agree to on paper. Okay. However, um, the, the NAR president, uh, Kevin Sears, while NAR may be confident that the terms of the settlement, that it, according to NAR president, Kevin Sears, agents and their clients can amend their representation agreement. Okay. They can amend it which opens up the possibility of agents and their clients changing how much their agent is being compensated if the seller of the property they are purchasing has decided to offer a higher amount of compensation, a cooperative conversation that the buyer and their agent has originally, uh, originally agreed upon. So Kevin Sears, the president of NAR, says that you, know, you can amend 
these representation agreements. So basically, if you know, if a seller is offering more, you can just amend the agreement, uh, you know, and and adjust for the higher amount that the seller is willing to pay. So there, there's a loophole right there. Um, but you you can read this. I'll put this link in the description. So you can read this. Disclose an inconspicuous language that the broker commissions are not set by law, right? And then here are some other some other things that that is said in this article. What I think is interesting is this last little uh, sentence right here. The NAR policy will not dictate, right? Not dictate how you represent them, non-exclusive, sub-agency, transactional, blah, blah, blah. Terms of the agreement, one day, one month, one house, zip code, services to be provided, like a certain number of showings, negotiations, presented offers, et cetera. And this last one, type or amount of compensation charged, right? Like zero dollar, like or you know, like a dollar amount, uh, X amount flat fee, X amount percentage, and X hourly rate, right? So, like, I've heard conflicting information there. Like, can we work by the hour, even though we're not employees, we're independent contractors, right? But here on our site, it actually says X amount uh, hourly rate, right? So, still a lot of questions going on out there in the world, all right? So, so, so that was the first. Um, takeaway from from the DOJ's meeting with NAR about, you know, revised forms, keeping those forms, you know, airtight, you know, making sure that it's abiding to all the settlement, uh, you know, things that were that were agreed on in the settlement. The second takeaway was implementing and adhering to settlement provisions in good faith. OK, um, this is basically talking about, you know, making sure that we follow the rules. The DOJ raised concerns regarding industry pr participants, you know, a.k.a. agents using potential avenues, potential avenues to circumvent the coming practice changes. To be clear, NAR and I personally oppose any attempts to circumvent the settlement. The practice changes should be implemented fully and in good faith in the service uh, of prov uh, promoting customer empowerment, customer ch consumer choice, and healthy competition, right? Answers to these questions about how to approach the practice are in detail available in our FAQ. So if you go to the FAQ, and I think the biggest thing here, guys, the biggest question about this is going to be around seller concessions, right? Seller concessions. If you look at number two, and I've read this entire FAQ, and I'm going to put a link in the description. I urge you to go read this so that you're just educated, right? You should be fully educated. But when we look at compensation offers moved off MLS, Okay, this is a number two of the FAQs. And, and the question is, what are the term, what are the key terms of the agreement? Okay, off and and you know, and so when it talks about the key terms of the agreement, we're talking about the compensation offers moved off MLS. NAR has agreed to put in place new rule prohibiting officers of uh, offers of compensation on MLS. Offers of compensation could continue to be an option consumers can pursue off MLS through negotiation and, and uh, consultation with real estate professionals. So basically, like through conversation, they're saying, OK, but why is this next sentence even in this paragraph about compensation? Right. It says and sellers can offer buyer concessions on an MLS. Why are we talking about buyer concessions? In a, in a paragraph that's talking about compensations, right? Um, and sellers can offer buyer concessions on MLS, for example, concessions for buyer closing costs. And so I guess where this is going is like, you know, they're basically saying like a buyer can use concessions that the seller is going to give towards the buyer's, um, you know, the buyer agent co commissions, Right. And, and and that's something that I haven't seen in writing, like clear cut. Right. Like, is 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 it OK? The DOJ. Right. A question for the DOJ, a question for NAR. Is it OK if a buyer uses seller concessions towards buyers uh, agent commissions? Right. Is that is that going to be fair game? Is that going to be OK? Right. Is it going to be OK? Um. Let's see a couple other things that I want to share with you in the FLQ uh, that I thought was really, or if you go down to number 74, it also talks about concessions, right? There's a, there's a section on concessions, right? And it talks about all this. There's, I mean, you know, 74 through 80, right, is all, all has to do with seller concessions. 
Okay. Number 74 says, is there an MLS policy about salary concessions? No, MLS will continue to have local discretion. Okay. Local discretion on seller concessions. This includes determining what local rules have about seller concessions, except under the settlement and MLS must ensure that the seller concessions are not limited to or conditioned upon the retention um, or of, of or payment to a cooperating broker, buyer, uh, broker, uh, buyer, broker, or other buyer representative, right? Some of these other questions, can MLS have a yes or no concession field? We know that we know that we can have that. Is an MLS required to have a concession field? Um, can I choose to publish cooperative, right? Like, no, the new rule would prohibit offers of compensation on MLS. The question is, if my MLS removes the compensation field, can I choose to publish my cooperative compensation offer in the agent remarks? Okay. So like, there's just, there's just, for me, there's just a little bit of unclarity, uh, on that. And, and I thought this was interesting. Does this mean a buyer broker may have to work for free? No, we have long believed that it's in the interest of the buyers, sellers, and their brokers to make offers of compensation, but using an MLS to do this will no longer be an option. The types of compensation available for buyer brokers, okay, include, but not limited to a fixed fee compensate, uh, commission paid directly by consumers. Okay. Sure. Concession from the seller. There it is again, concession from the seller. Right. So if we can pay the commission as a concession from the seller and we can put concession on MLS, then essentially, is that not where we're going to put the buyer broker commission? I mean, I mean, I'm just and, and, and then in, the, and in that case, the, buy, the buyer is deciding if they want to use that concession towards whatever they want, which it could be, you know, closing costs. It could be their agent commission. It could be repairs on the house. It could be whatever. Right. But right here that they're saying that the types of compensation available for buyer brokers include, but not limited to, and the second one is concession from the seller. Also portion of the listing brokers compensation. Do what? Isn't that what we're arguing against here? That's how we get paid. Now we get a portion of the listing brokers compensation. Okay. You guys realize like right now, as it stands before the August 17th changeover, that a seller agrees into a listing agreement to pay 5%. They're paying that 5%, whether regardless if there's a buyer agent involved or not, that's what they're paying the listing agent to sell the property. Now, the fact that the listing agent decides they're going to pay half of that or whatever percentage of that to the buyer broker, to the buyer broker if one is uh, involved, that's up to them. And this, again, uh, was the technicality that the lawyers found. On the HUD statement, it shows that the seller's paying that. But really, originally, the seller agreed to pay the full 5%, and the, and the listing broker decided to pay the buyer broker a part of what the seller agreed to pay them uh, you know, to, to compensate them to bring the buyer. right? And, but that's how it actually works in reality, but the technicality is, is on the HUD statement, it shows that the seller's paying it. When really, they're actually paying the listing broker, and the listing broker's paying the buyer broker but it's not, that's not how the paper trail goes. And that was the, the technicality the lawyers found. And they said, let's go make a billion. Let's go make a billion dollars. <laughs> um, you know, who can blame them, right? Who can blame them, I guess. I mean, as long as you can sleep at night. Fact of the matter is, is that they're continuing to say here that a portion of the listing broker's compensation um, is a form of how the buyer broker um, can, be, can be paid. Right. Let's drive over to the email that I got from my local uh, MLS. OK, um, basically under the agreement, the new MLS practices will take into effect August 17th. OK, so we're right in line with August 17th. You know, I'm sure you are, you know, call your local MLS, see what date everything's going to come into place. Our, our MLS policies and procedures will be updated to reflect these changes at the local level. Fields regarding compensation will be removed from our MLS. However, brokerages are not prohibited from displaying offers of compensation on their of their listings fr fr uh, from their listings on their own websites or other media and marketing materials. OK. So my website that I have listings on, it's IDX Fed, comes from MLS. How am I going to go in there and change the listings that are on my website to show the buyer broker commission? I can't. I mean, I can't edit a listing. Maybe, maybe some of you have the ability to do so. Maybe there's a button I haven't found yet. 
And if I have, that's great. Am I going to have to, am I going to go in there every single listing and, and show buyers your commission and who actually is even looking at my website? Um, you know, our agents going to start looking on other agents, personal websites to find out if the buyer agency, uh, uh, broker com commission exists, you know, uh, or we're going to have to start calling and this is where I believe it's going to go. We're going to have to call, you know, once we have the buyer and we know what they want to go look at, then we'll spend some time to, you know, or have our assistants or whatever, or maybe shoot an email and say, Hey, are you guys paying a buyer broker commission on this listing? How much, if so, how much is it so that we know? It's like, let's take away transparency. <laughs> we don't want to know. We want to have to call and reach out to to find out what it is. You can do it. You can do it. You just can't tell anybody. <laughs> you know, you just, it's just got to be secretive, right? We got we to hide this from the general public. got to hide this from each other. And if you want to know, you're going to have to call the listing agent. You're going to have to reach out to their office to find out for your client. So your client decide what they want to do, because at this point, Mr. DOJ, Mr. Uh, plaintiff's lawyers, you've put them, the buyers in a position where now they literally may have to decide not to buy a house if the seller's not offering a buyer to commission, which, by the way, they've always had the choice to do. See, what I think is, is they, they went too hard with this. When they got to the point where NAR decided to offer zero on MLS and give the sellers a choice, I think we could have, you know, restructured the forms. And made it to where um, it was a more clear that they had a choice. They could offer zero if they wanted to, and then we should have left it right there. But no, we have to remove that field from MLS. Even though we can offer it, you can't make you can't tell a seller they can't offer it. You can offer it, but you, you it, it, this is just it just doesn't make any sense. It just doesn't make any sense. Furthermore, written buyer agreements will be required b uh, before a property is shown. Um, these are uh, these agreements do not have to be buyer agency agreements. OK, that's a new one, but they must include an objective amount with clarity on the amount of rate of compensation. We currently are updating forms, so we don't even have the forms yet for the new buyer agency, buyer agreements, listing agreements. We don't we don't even have those yet. We don't even know what they look like. Um, this doesn't apply to open houses. OK, so when buyers, if you're at an open house, you're working for the seller and buyers are coming through, you don't have to, you know, get them to sign, get every single buyer walking through there to sign. And then this one. Kind of confused me, kind of didn't. Um, continual negotiation conversations and updated agreements between the agent and the buyer can take place throughout the process of finding the right home. So basically right here, they're repeating what the president of NAR said, that you can amend these agreements as you go along, right? And so say you say the, sell, the buyer agrees to pay you 2% or agrees that they hope that <laughs> the seller pays you 2% and then they find a house where the seller pays 3%. Well, you can just amend that. You can just amend the agreement. Um, and it says, as long as an offer is not held hostage by these negotiations on your buyer agency agreement. So it's like the buyer agency agreement, the negotiations of the buyer agency agreement cannot hold up an offer being made, as this would violate Article 1 of the Realtor Code of Ethics, which requires realtors to act in the best interest of their clients. Basically, act within the best interest of your clients, regardless of what you're being paid. Um, that's that's what I read. I actually sent them an email to clarify exactly what they meant by this. Um, but at the end of the day, what I'm reading is that, hey, if a buyer doesn't want to amend for this new situation that you're in, um, then they don't have to. And by the way, you still have to rep you still have to pursue them and act in the best interest of them, even if you're not exactly happy or exactly not satisfied with whatever the agreement is you you have to basically according to the article one of the realtor code of ethics which requires realtors to act in the best interest of their clients now i want to go through a couple of ideas here to help you become more efficient because you need you need this mindset right you you need my mind if i could just you know take this out and just put it in there then i absolutely would it doesn't work like that so the best i can do is just make a youtube video hoping that you absorb some of this energy because i'm telling you right now I would crush it in this new market. Last week, I made live calls. I picked up a buyer and a seller that would sell to that buyer. I found a buyer out of thin air and a seller out of thin air, $2 million deal and a listing appointment set, all in a matter of 30 minutes out of thin air. I didn't know these people. I haven't made calls in months and months and months and months. I'm making live calls again this Wednesday at the same time, 3 p.m. Eastern, right here on this YouTube channel. So make sure you're subscribed and tuned in because I'm going to do it again. Nevertheless, 
let me digress for a second and get into this because you could build a more efficient business in this new world. I'm going to tell you a couple of things. Number one, focus on listings. And the second thing I'm going to tell you is, is the most important thing. But the first thing, this is the most obvious, yes, but I want you to think about this. Focus on listings. This has never been a better time to focus on listings. Now, list to last has been uh, been a been a principle that has been around for hundreds of years, and it's absolutely true. There are very successful buyer agents. Um, there's people that are exclusively exclusively work with buyers. They have really successful businesses. Not a business I would want, and not a business ninety nine percent of agents would want. If you ask an agent, if you ask you know millions of agents, and you say, "Hey, would you rather have thirty active listings?" 30 active listings or 30 active buyers, 99% of them will say the listings. There are 1% who are like, I want the buyers because later I'm going to get the listings. Well, if you got the listings, you got the buyers today. If you represent a buyer, they got to buy, and then you got to give them three to five to six to seven years, however long it's going to be before they sell, and then you get the listing. When you represent a seller who's going to buy, you get both deals now today. Not to mention, you can actually manage 30 listings. You can't manage 30 buyers unless you have a team of agents. Now you're managing agents. Oh, I don't want that either. I'd rather sit around as a single agent and stack listings to the moon. And there was one point in my career where I had 72 active listings. I can do that as a single agent with one assistant. I mean, I wasn't even, you know, like... It, it, you very manageable, right? Listings equal leverage. Listings equal freedom. Listings equal quality of life as a real estate agent. Um, when you have, when your business is focused on buyers. Now, I focused 100% of my efforts on listings. When you focus 100% of your efforts on listings, 80% of your business will be listings. 20% will be Buyers. That's right. Buyers. Why is that? Because you're going to have sellers who sell and then buy. You're going to have people that want to buy your listings and you're going to get referrals. You're just going to get referrals and you may get a random buyer, you know, here and there, whatever. But 20% of your business will be buyers consistently through my entire career. My business was 80, 20. Don't you want to 80, 20? Right. And if you want to 80, 20, 80% 80 listings, 20% buyer, if that's the kind of business you want, that's the kind of business model that you want, which it should be then you have to focus 100% on listings. Anything you do to go out and try to attract a buyer is only adding to the 20% you're already going to get if you're focusing on listings at all. If you if you if your business is all buyers, well you're just that's a very inefficient I hate to say it, that's a very inefficient business. If you're if you have 30 active buyers and you're a single agent and they're just driving you all around town, you have no time to continue to build your business, continue to grow, to continue to leverage. You're not leveraging anything. If you have 30 active listing active buyers and you have a team of agents out there doing that, now you're managing the agents, paying them 50% or 60%. I don't know how much you're paying them, but you're giving them most all the money. Right. And, and you're managing them. Right. And you may be a great manager. You may want to go do that. That's awesome. If you do, I'm not built that way. I'm not built that way. I would rather keep right. So think about it. There's 30 deals either way. You got 30 buyers or 30, 30 sellers, 30 deals either way. Right. If you if you do the buyer route and you build a team, you're giving away half the money of the 30 deals. If you've got if you're just a single agent, you got listings, you get 100 percent of the listing money. This is just the way my brain operates. My brain operates on efficiency. Right. I want to be more efficient. So focus on listings. 100 percent of your efforts on listings. If you're not a great listing agent, that's okay. Become a great listing agent. There's plenty of information and training and coaching out there to help you become a great listing agent. You're going to have to anyway, because you're about to have to have the same appointments you have with sellers to get listings with buyers. You're going to have to sit down with them and do a buyer, a buyer uh, appointment. Instead of a listing appointment, you have to do a buyer appointment and sit down with them and have them sign a piece of paper saying they're going to work with you and pay you X amount. Same thing that sellers do. So you're going to have to do this either way. All right, why not become a great listing agent? I do a listing appointment challenge every month. The next one is August 5th. I'll put a link in the description, setmorelistingappointments.com. It's a week-long training, Q&A with me all week. I'm going to go through everything. I'm going to teach you more about real estate than you ever even thought that you knew. So the first thing is, is become a great listing agent. The second thing is, and I love this one, this is the one that I think is just dynamite here. This going to, and this is what's going to, the first one's kind of like, you should be doing that anyway. The second one is what this shakeup is going to make you do. It's going to force you to do. And that's this only spend your time 
on dollar productive activities. What do I mean by that? I mean, every single client that you work with, every customer that you work with now is going to have signed a piece of paper agreeing to pay you. That's not the way it is right now. We get a call from a buyer and they want to see a house. We just, we, 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 we pack up, you know, cancel the rest of our day and we go show the house with really nothing in writing, right? Nothing in writing. Now we're not going to do that. We're not going to, we're all, and if, and, if, and, and, and we're going to sit down with the buyer, have them sign a piece of paper saying that they're willing to pay this amount. And if they don't sign it, we're not working with them. Isn't that more efficient? Are you going to lose? You're going to have to turn away some buyers. That's much more efficient than working with every single buyer. Let me tell you much more efficient than work with every single buyer, because if they don't sign that contract, boom, you, 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 you're like, okay, well, um, let me know if something changes or whatever your script is from that point. When that buyer goes to another agent or decides not to buy or whatever it is they're going to do, they're going to go somewhere else. You're going to put them in your database to get the weekly email. They may call you in the future or whatever, but you're going to move right over to a, a potential customer who will sign a contract with you. And now every single move that you make is dollar productive. You're not out there just running around for free, not really knowing what's going to happen. Not really. There's a lot of uncertainty. I'm saying this to give you some silver lining here. Do I like what's happening with the industry? Nope. Do I wish that it would continue to stay the same? Yep. Because I think it's best for consumers. I think it's best for, for consumers. Number one, consumers, number one, because they get representation. If a buyer is like, I don't want to sign that because I don't want to be on the hook to have to pay this, or I can't afford it or whatever. They may get shut out from their own representation, and first-time home buyers is going to be the worst. They can barely come up with a down payment, and now you're going to tell them that they have to pay a, 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 their, their buyer agent's commission on top of that. Who knows how builders are going to respond and how all this is going to play out when the dust settles. But I'll tell you this, the market is the market, and people have choices right now, and they choose to pay. The sellers are choosing to pay the buyer agent commission now from what for out of what they agreed to pay the listing broker, okay? Out of what they agreed to pay the listing broker, the listing brokers are paying the buyer agent commission. And evidently it's still going to be uh, that's still going to be legal according to everything that I'm reading. Uh, so you just can't put it on MLS. It's the craziest thing. My point is is this, you're only going to be working with buyers who have agreed to pay you. Isn't that more efficient? Let me just ask you, don't you feel like, I mean, it's going to cut some buyers out that don't want to work with you. Maybe they want to work with another agent. Maybe they don't want to pay a buyer agent commission, whatever the case may be. There's still going to be a lot of sellers. I would say, if I had to say 90 plus percent, even when this, even when the hammer drops, 90 plus percent of sellers, I believe, this is just my opinion, will still continue to offer the buyer agent commission um, through whatever means you have to offer it. Uh, and then as time goes on, that's going to increase. It's going to be in the low 90s. It's going to get back to 95. It's going to get back to 96, 97, and eventually get back to exactly where we are right now because the market is the market. All right. So anyway, I hope this video helps you. I hope you start to try to visualize a more efficient way to build your business according to the new rules. Because guess what? We can't change the rules. That's the thing. You can't you can't change the rules. You can't control the rules. You can only play by whatever rules are in front of you and make the best out of them. That's why I'm, I'm an optimist, right? When you look at the debate that would just happen in the presidential debate, you think, okay, is this going to be Trump part two? Are we going to get Biden in, back in there? Is Biden going to be replaced? You know, all these thoughts go on in our head. Let me tell you what the best part is. It doesn't matter. The president's not responsible for your happiness over the next four years. They're not responsible for the amount of success that you have. Only you are. You got to take whatever the rules are and apply them to your business in, in a way that that is it, that is very extremely profitable, very efficient, um, and that you can actually visualize whatever your dreams are. Right. You, you, there are people, let me just say, there are people that are in far worse circumstances, far worse circumstances that crush it. They don't have any excuses. I believe that agents will make this an excuse of why they can't, of why they're not, of why they couldn't as they leave the business or whatever the case may be. And I'm here to tell you that that is a, an excuse and that's all that it is. You can, okay, under any circumstances, you 
can achieve whatever it is you want to achieve. This business is unlimited forever. Forever. You cannot, and that's a great thing. That's what that's that's the silver lining, really, right there, is that it doesn't matter what happens. There's always unlimited business for you. Why? Because you're a microscopic piece of dust compared to the overall market, even in just your local market, right? The number one guy probably has 1% market share. You know, you as an agent that's doing like 20, 30, 40, 50 deals, you're, you're like 0.0001% of the market share. I'm telling you, I'm telling you. And there was an article that came out. What the top 1% of agents in the country are doing 15% of the business. The top 1% are doing 15% of the business. How do you become part of the 1%? By thinking the way I'm telling you to think that there is no competition, that business is unlimited, closings happen every day regardless of market conditions, and it's an all-you-can-eat buffet to go get as much as you want. All right, I am out. I'll be uh, doing live calls Wednesday, 3 p.m. Eastern. Be there or be square. I hope this video gave you a different perspective and shared some, some insights that you can take with you as you prepare for the changes coming. And, uh, man, I just love you guys so much. I want to see you crush it the way that I'm crushing it. All right, I'll see you on the next video. Let's go.